Hello there. My name is Bill Hallen and the Trauma Program Manager from the University of Rochester Kessler Trauma Center. With me today is Dr. Mark Gestring, Chief of Trauma Surgery and Chair of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma Stop the Bleed Committee, and Ben Sensenbach, Administrator for the Division of Pre-Hospital Medicine and Paramedic for the Mel Rims Region. What we're going to do today is provide you with the education and training for the Stop the Bleed skills and lecture for May 20th, 2021, Stop the Bleed Day that's coming up in the near future. You're gonna be able to provide, receive this training and education so you can attend a skills session in your community and learn how to stop the bleed. So Dr. Gestring is gonna begin and teach us the skills and techniques and knowledge necessary to know how to stop the bleed. Dr. Gestring. Thanks, Bill. We're gonna jump right into the material and uh, Bill and Ben will, will help fill in the gaps that I might have left out. So the material we're gonna cover is, is a joint product of multiple organizations who are specifically involved in this, in this area. The American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma working with the uh, College of Emergency Physicians and the National Association of EMTs really have been the driving force with putting this all together. Uh, this is a course about bleeding, so we'll do our best not to show really gross images, but understand that some images shown during the presentation may be disturbing based on the fact that this is a bleeding course and we're going to have to display at least a little bit uh, uh, images of bleeding. So please be aware of that and uh, you've been so advised. So why do you need this training? The number one cause of preventable death following trauma is bleeding. All right, that's, that's a very significant point. The number one cause of preventable death is bleeding. All right, and, and how do people get injured? They get injured in a number of ways. This course was originally developed because of problems with active shooters and responding um, agencies to active shooter events. But in reality, when we teach this course now, we've really focused on all hazards. This could be a hunting accident, a, a home accident, an industrial accident, something at school. Uh, there's just a, a, a thousand ways people can get injured and the, the skills that we're going to talk about are things that can be done by somebody without medical training who happens to be there when it happens. As you saw in the video earlier, we, we, call, we call what used to be the bystander now the immediate responder so that when you were there when something happens, your opportunity to make a meaningful contribution to this patient's survival will occur in those brief minutes between when the injury occurs and help actually arrives. So the goals of the course are really quite simple. Number one, recognize what is considered life-threatening bleeding. And number two, learn some basic skills for what to do in the scenario when you're faced with life-threatening bleeding. And essentially we're talking about three pretty simple skills. We're gonna learn how to apply pressure. We're gonna learn how to pack wounds. And then if you have access to a tourniquet, we're gonna talk about how to put a tourniquet on. We'll talk briefly about the access issue because you really kind of need to have a, a, uh, a stop the bleed or some sort of a first aid kit close by in order to have access to the tourniquet. But it does not mean just because you don't have a tourniquet doesn't mean you can't make a meaningful difference in a patient's survival following one of these events. The very first thing to think about is your own personal safety, right? So your safety has to be the first priority. So if you come across a patient who is injured in the fast lane of the throughway, Make sure they get off the throughway before you do anything, right? If, you, if, if you're at risk, you're not going to be able to help others. So whether it's an active shooter situation or whether you're in a bad traffic situation or whether you're, you know, in, wherever it is that you are, the patient has to be moved to safety. You have to be safe before you can do any of that stuff. So you either help the patient move or you drag them or you get some help dragging them or, you know, just make sure that you are safe. That's the first priority. And along the lines, uh, there's, you know, this is a bleeding course. And if you're not walking around with blood, with uh, gloves in your pocket, there's a chance you could get some blood on your hands. That in and of itself is not necessarily a big deal. You wash it off, let somebody know that you got, uh, had a blood exposure. Obviously, if you have access to a first aid kit or a stop the bleed kit, it will contain gloves and that will obviously be your first choice. But once again, you wanna maintain, uh, wanna maintain your own safety as you go forward. So we talk about the ADCs. So number one is alert. Right, so everything we're gonna talk about is geared toward what do you do until help arrives? If you haven't called them, they're not coming. So whether you call or whether somebody around you is directed to call, the first step is to call 911, tell them where you are and what's going on. The second step is gonna be look for bleeding. We'll talk about that. And then the third thing 
uh, will be compression. So that that really speaks to the three skills that are involved, whether it's direct pressure, whether it's wound packing, or whether it's the use of a tourniquet. So the ABCs are really the first three, the three steps that we're going to really harp on today. All right. So obviously you're going to call 911 if you need help. Right. Know your location. If you don't know your location, hope that your phone does. In the world of cell phones that are GPS enabled, many times that will that will help you, especially if you're in the woods or you're on, on a highway where you don't know your exact location. And then there's a good chance that you will be getting instructions by the 911 operator, the person you talk to. So follow those instructions as well. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to learn to look for life-threatening bleeding. We're not talking about cuts and scratches here. We're talking about life-threatening bleeding. So you need to look for that bleeding, right? So the way we describe it is pulsatile bleeding, continuous bleeding, bleeding that's clearly large volume, bleeding that's pooling, or you know, actively squirting. Those are the kinds of bleeding we're talking about. In order to find them, many times you have to expose the wound. So you might have to re remove shirts or pants or cut shirts or pants to be able to find where the bleeding is, okay? Uh, there may be multiple sites of bleeding, so try and get a good look at what's going on. You wanna try and follow the puddles, see where they're coming from. Once again, clothing may hide uh, life-threatening bleeding, so you need to you know, tear the clothes or open the clothes to, to look underneath if you see blood uh, accumulating in those areas. All right, so essentially when we talk about bleeding for the purposes of, the, of this course, we talk about three different zones of the body. All right, the first is the extremities, right? So you see the arms and the legs, right? And for the purposes of this slide, they're blue, but basically the arms and the legs bleeding in that region is treated uh, differently than what we call the junctional zones, which is, which is uh, bleeding from the neck, the armpits, or the groins, right? And then lastly, bleeding from the central core of the torso, we have a different way of approaching that. So we're going to talk about the skills in those three areas. Now I'll stop for a minute and just ask Bill or Ben to make sure I haven't forgotten anything to this point because we want to stay as honest as we can and keep things on track here. No, Dr. Gestering, I think you hit all the right points there. I think that it really helps the layperson understand the techniques you're going to discuss in a minute by identifying these three areas of limbs, junction, and core. That's really how we talk about it in the hospital, how EMS talks about it, and, and it's a good way to teach it. Very good. So and then once you've identified life-threatening bleeding, we're going to spend the bulk of the course here talking about what you do about it. All right. So, so the first thing we do is considered call, is called direct pressure, considered direct pressure. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's very simple. You find the wound, you apply direct pressure to the wound and focus on the bleeding. You try and use some material between you and the wound. So if you have a bleeding control kit, you can use gauze. If you don't, you can use a piece of clean cloth, you know, whether it's a tied up shirt or a necktie or whatever, something along those lines. You find a piece of cloth, you put it over the wound and you push. You push directly onto the, onto the wound until the bleeding stops. So, um, and if that works, you do that until help arrives. So we're gonna to come to a video here and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask Ben to, to explain what's happening here. So Ben, you on board with that? Absolutely. All right, so here we see a video and I'm gonna shut up now so you can talk. So this mannequin obviously represents a injured extremity and you can see the lay provider is using a t-shirt and she's using the weight of her body to drive her palms down into the wound. This is key because this allows so much more pressure to be delivered to the source of the bleeding. So this works extremely well in, on extremities. It works extremely well on junctional areas, but it's a little bit harder to operationalize depending on where on the torso it is. So if you have something on the neck, for instance, holding direct pressure will work, but it might be a little more challenging to do that. So it'll, it'll depend a little bit on the location of the wound and the size of the wound. So we're gonna give you yet another option if you're faced with this problem. So this was direct pressure. Once again, a piece of cloth or a piece of bandage and directly, like Ben said, directly applied to the wound with, with kind of the full force of your body. The next thing we're gonna talk about is, is basically direct pressure on steroids or wound packing. This is for larger wounds. 
right? So you, you found a larger wound has a bit of more of a, an open component to it. Direct pressure would not really get to the root of the bleeding, right? So, so what we do in this case is we take the material that we were going to use for direct pressure and we pack it into the wound. So if that's a clean bandage, that's wonderful if you have access to a, a kit. If not, you're going to use some clean piece of cloth. You're going to stuff it into the hole and then you're going to hold pressure on the entire thing. So I'm going to move to a slide. I'm going to ask Ben once again to talk about the video that comes along with that. You ready, Ben? Right. Yes, sir. So as you'll see, they're using a gauze called quick clot, but any gauze will work for this procedure. Push the gauze as far down into the wound track as you can and keep driving down to the bottom of the wound. Is this uh, is this provider is packing this wound, you'll notice that they're moving their fingers in a, a clockwise or compass wise fashion. They do that to make sure that they get the gauze deep inside all aspects of the wound. Once the gauze has been placed, notice they use that same downward pressure that we discussed before. But a key element in this next step is applying pressure for three minutes. It takes three minutes for a clot to begin forming down to the bottom of that gauze. Very good. And then once again, you're gonna maintain that pressure until help arrives. So that's the reason you called 911 before you started. So hopefully by the time you've, you've made some headway here, you'll have, uh, you'll have medical assistance at your side. Okay, <clears throat> so compression, uh, we're just gonna go through these. Um, pictures real quick here. So when you look at the three zones that we referred to earlier, right, direct pressure will work on the arms and the legs and on the junctional areas. So that blue zone on the green zones. All right. Uh, the wound packing will also work on the arms and legs and on the, on the junctional areas. Uh, wound packing might be easier in the junctional areas than direct pressure because those wounds, uh, the location on the body, like in the armpits and the neck, it might be easier to pack the wound and then hold pressure compared to just holding pressure. The reason we single out the body, the torso, is because there's not much you can do about bleeding in those areas. Patients who are bleeding actively from the chest or abdomen, they really need to go to a trauma center quickly. So there's not much you're going to be able to do in the field other than call for help and get them moving along. Holding pressure on the stab wound or a gunshot wound is really not gonna help if it's over the torso because the bleeding comes from way deeper inside the abdomen or the chest. All right, so <clears throat> I mentioned earlier the tourniquet. We're gonna spend a minute talking about tourniquets. Um, tourniquets are devices that are used to limit blood flow or, or stop blood flow into an extremity. Uh, these were, uh, historically have been around for a long time, but recently have been used successfully in the military, and that's what's driven much of what we've learned in the civilian world. Tourniquets um, are generally um, uh, professionally made. They're, um, they're, pre they're basically uh, made by companies. Uh, we steer people away from using homemade tourniquets. Not that a homemade tourniquet might not work, but almost, almost always it doesn't work, so you're much better off you're in a situation where you come across bleeding and you don't have a tourniquet available to you, a commercially made tourniquet, you want to, you want to try using direct pressure or wound packing. In the event that you have access to a tourniquet because you have a bleeding control kit or some other types of equipment, we're going to go through with you now how to use it. It's actually quite simple and very effective. In general, you're going to apply the tourniquet above the wound. You're going to try not to put it over joints. And you're basically going to tighten this thing until the bleeding stops. It's as simple as that. Once you've done that, you're gonna leave it on. You're not gonna peek, you're not gonna take it off. You're gonna leave it right where it is, all right? So uh, you can apply a tourniquet to others. You can apply a tourniquet to yourself. This is extremely important if you're out by yourself, you're on a motorcycle or you're hunting and you accidentally get injured, you can, you can apply this tourniquet to yourself if you've practiced this skill. It can be applied over clothes, but once again, it's important to know where the wound actually is. So you probably have to peek at the wound to see what it is that you're trying to control. All right? Tourniquets hurt. All right? They save lives, but they hurt. So it, do not be distracted by the fact that the patient feels pain, because that's what's going to that's what's going to keep them alive long enough to get to real help. All right? In rare in rare instances, maybe a, in a large thigh or something like that, you might need a second tourniquet to stop the bleeding, depending on um, 
what the way it works after the first one, but you'll get a sense the first tourniquet will slow things down, but you might have to either supplement with direct, direct pressure uh, or find a second tourniquet. Once again, I have a short video to show you here, and I'll ask Ben one more time to, uh, to take us through what we're seeing. What you see here is a gentleman sitting up with his arm exposed, and you're gonna see a tourniquet being placed. So this is the cat tourniquet. It is being placed around the extremity, two to three inches above the wound. They're feeding the tip of the belt through the buckle and pulling it as tight as they can. This is a crucial step. You only want to be, you don't want to have room for more than one finger underneath that tourniquet as it's being placed. Then they begin spinning the windlass. They're going to spin the windlass until the bleeding stops. This step is painful, but it's crucial for the patient. Then they lock the windlass into the windlass clip, cover the excess Velcro, and secure with the final strap. There is a place on that white strap to mark the time for tourniquet placement. If possible, please note the time uh, so the trauma surgeons like Dr. Gestring have uh, some extra information to go on for the long-term treatment. Thank you, Ben. So when, when you look at this, you can see why this very simple device is actually a little more complicated than that. And if you were to try and, and rebuild this on your own with a stick and a belt, you're gonna have a problem. These devices are made with Velcro that's particularly strong and these windless rods are particularly strong and they're the proper width so that they won't create any tissue damage when you put them on. So the preference is always to have a tourniquet uh, when you're doing, when you're trying to use this skill. So uh, a big part of the stop the bleed effort and something we'll talk about a little bit later is getting this equipment into the public space. If you um, uh, want to have a first aid, first aid kit at home, make sure you have a tourniquet in there. You'll find it's extremely simple to work. They don't expire. They're generally cheap, but but having one around when you need one is really kind of a, a, a priceless commodity. All right, so we talked about tourniquets. Uh, uh, ben described that this is a cat tourniquet, but in fact, there are a number of other types of tourniquets that are all commercially made. Uh, the American College of Surgeons, who pretty much developed this course, uses guidelines by the, the Commission on Tactical, is that the uh, TCCC, right? The Committee on Technic on <laughs> Tactical, help me, Bill. Tactical Combat Casualty that's, Care. That's what I'm looking for, right? So, so those guys have experience with this material. They have uh, vetted these tourniquets, and there are a number of different tourniquets on the market that accomplish the same thing. In essence, they're uh, a thick band that is uh, pulled tight in some manner or fashion. The cat tourniquet tends to be the easiest and the most available, but there are multiple other ones out there. Uh, if you look at stopthebleed.org, you'll see recommendations for approved tourniquets if you wanna go in a different direction. You can see a list here. There's several generations of the cat tourniquet and some other types. Uh, it is important to avoid ones that are not on the list. If you see a, if you see a, a tourniquet on Amazon for, for $4, it's probably not a good tourniquet. The average tourniquet costs between $30 and $40, maybe $50, depending on the, the guts of it. But uh, the, cheap, the cheap copies uh, generally do not work when you need them to work. So once again, on stopthebleed.org, you can follow the links to equipment and that'll, that'll direct you toward what type of tourniquets you may, might wanna include in your kit. But for the most part, the cat tourniquet is probably the easiest, the cheapest, and the uh, uh, best option for most people. Uh, there's uh, this last slide talks about pneumatic lip, pneumatic lip tourniquets. These are kind of blow up type devices that are also available if you want to prefer to use something like that. A question that comes up often is bleeding control in children, right? So in essence, everything we just said for adults works in children. The only thing worth considering is if the child is particularly small, the mechanism of the tourniquet might preclude getting a good tight fit around the extremity. And for those cases, uh, wound packing and direct pressure might be a better choice. Once again, the arms are small or the legs are small, so you can generally get your hand around there and give it a good squeeze until help arrives. Uh, if the tourniquet fits and obviously works, you'll see that there's enough room for it to cinch up. If the tourniquet fits on the child, it should be fine to use that. Okay, so <clears throat> frequently, I frequently asked questions here relate to impaled objects. Generally, if you have an impaled object, uh, a branch or a knife or something like that sticking out of, out of a patient, we generally try to leave those right where we find them. Uh, we try not to disturb those. We already talked about improvised tourniquets a little bit. 
uh, if you're if you're an expert and you know exactly what you're trying to accomplish, there's, there's a possibility that you'll be able to do this effectively. But most people in, in an emergency situation really aren't um, aren't equipped to run around and start looking for bands and sticks and things like that. In those cases, direct pressure and um, uh, wound packing are probably your best option. Um, what about the loss of an arm or a leg? Does, I think this question relates to the safety of tourniquets. I can tell you that if tourniquets are used properly, they're 100% safe. Uh, if you put a tourniquet on and leave it on for two days, that's a different story, but the majority of these are used for uh, a short period of time, up to three, four hours, and uh, that's completely safe. And even if the patient has an arterial injury, the risk of using a tourniquet are, are much less than the risk of just letting this thing bleed. So, so we don't worry about complications, uh, at least early on for what we're talking about. We mentioned pain. pain. Pain is a factor with tourniquets. If you're using them correctly, they do hurt. But if the patient's awake and alert to complain about pain, then you're doing something right. So by other questions, this is my, this is my cue to ask Bill and Ben to once again jump in and rescue me for things I might have forgotten to say or other things that have come up as you, uh, both of you guys have taught this course. So Dr. Gethring, this, uh, this class is going all throughout the Finger Lakes region of Western New York here. Uh, what about when someone applies either a dressing, pressure, packing, or a tourniquet, uh, and they think that there's going to be a, a considerable transport time or they're waiting for EMS and it appears the bleeding has stopped? Should any of those therapies be reevaluated or checked, taken down, changed? Uh, what should happen after the bleeding is stopped? So in our region, in Western New York, there's really no reason to take a tourniquet off the peak. Once, you know, if you have a tourniquet or, or even if you're doing uh, wound packing, don't peak. Leave what you've done that's working, leave it alone. Because the chance of knocking a clot off and, and, resume, and having the bleeding resume is very high. Uh, the tourniquet, you take it down, they start bleeding again. Now that answer might not be the same answer you get in, in the rural west of the United States. We're developing protocols now for for what you do with a tourniquet that's been on four or five hours, and it's possible that in those scenarios the answer might be a little different. But in Western New York, you're not uh, you're not going to be um, far enough away from a trauma center where you're going to merit taking a look underneath. So once you've controlled the bleeding, consider it a win and leave it the way it is. Is that the answer, Bill? No, I think that's exactly what uh, what we see happen and what answers in the community. Anything else we should we should talk about here before we begin to wrap up? Ben? Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Gestring, just one uh, one comment from teaching this course before. There's a lot of folks out there that have seen the photos from the Boston Marathon, and there were a very large number of improvised tourniquets that were used in that setting that had some success. But the reason they were successful is nobody let go. So they used belts and purse straps as improvised tourniquets but then someone was physically applying force to hold that, uh, to hold that tourniquet. Um, and I, I think that that's something that comes up a lot. Lots of folks, um, they hear about using belts and uh, typically there's not, uh, there's not enough, uh, enough leverage on the belt unless you're applying that, that human strength to it. Very good. And that, you know, it comes up all the time because you know, if, if you were involved in a bleeding incident right this very second, do you have a tourniquet in your pocket? Do you have a tourniquet in your trunk? Is there one in your, in your kitchen? Most people, I think, would say no. So, you know, so what would you do if you don't have access to this equipment? Well, you know, I, I guess if you knew exactly what you were trying to do, an improvised tourniquet might work. But to, to Ben's point, and to what we've kind of said earlier, you're much better off with direct pressure and uh, wound packing because those things are much more uh, likely to work in the short term. I completely agreed, sir. Thank you. All right. So, <clears throat> so just to summarize what we've talked about, personal safety is number one. So if you're in a dangerous situation, you really can't administer aid to somebody else. You really have to uh, figure out a way to get that person to safety before you can begin the techniques we talked about. Uh, the ABC approach to this problem, right? Everything we're teaching you is, is related to what can you do to stop the bleeding until help arrives? Help has to know that they, that you're calling for them, right? So, so the, 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 you know, the function of calling for help has to really be first. So whether you do this yourself or you have somebody do it, you got to call for help, tell them what you're dealing with, tell them where you are. The next step is find the bleeding, right? So we describe what life-threatening bleeding looks like. It's going to be pulsatile. It's going to be 
rapidly accumulating on the, on the floor, those types of bleeding. We're not talking about cuts and scratches here. We're talking about life-threatening bleeding, right? We're going to, once we find that bleeding, we have three different techniques that we're going to use. We're going to use direct pressure or compression, right? And if the hole, if the wound is too big, we're going to fill that hole or that wound with hopefully clean gauze. But if you don't have clean gauze, any clean cloth, and then you're going to hold pressure. So both of those are really different types of pressure. And then lastly, if you have access to a tourniquet and, and the bleeding is coming from a place where you can use a tourniquet, so specifically an extremity, you can use a tourniquet on the extremity to control hemorrhage, right? And then once again, you're going to stop that bleeding and you're going to stay, stay with the patient until help arrives. So uh, and we're going to have a little kind of group discussion here. But before we do that, I'm going to just refer interested people to the website stopthebleed.org. This has it, this has information relating to training that you can get. It has a lot of stories related to uh, Stop to Bleed Saves. It, it helps you outfit a kit and has a lot of just background information and um, uh, graphics and things that you could potentially use uh, you know, as you learn more about this. We like to say that the only thing more tragic than a death is a death that could have been prevented. Uh, there are several things that are probably worth talking about briefly that I want to spend a minute with my expert panel here just kind of discussing. So the Stop the Bleed initiative comp is composed of several different components. The education piece is huge. And what we've just gone through with you now is the, uh, uh, is the actual course that is being taught to, to non-medically trained providers, the average citizen, to teach them what to do if they're faced with this emergency. The next component, though, uh, above and beyond the teaching, is the pre-positioning of supplies. So uh, the people in the leadership of this program are working hard to get bleeding control kits into the public space. This was done years ago with the defibrillators that help uh, that help people with CPR, right? Yeah. So we're trying to get those bleeding control kits into the space where if you need one, you can find one. So we've had success on multiple levels, uh, mostly through, through private companies and now lately through kind of county government, getting those kits into public spaces. But if there's a way you can do that, uh, we would certainly encourage you to help by speaking to somebody in a position of leadership, whether it's at a business where you work or whether it's in your town or in your county. Um, and then there's also what you can do for yourself. You want to have this equipment available to you should you need it. So if you're a hunter, there's really no reason that you couldn't have a very small bleeding control kit that you carry with you. God forbid you were injured in the middle of the woods. If you were on a motorcycle, same thing. So, you know, we encourage people to, uh, to think ahead and to have this equipment. The equipment is generally not expensive and it doesn't expire. So it's something you can buy, put in your car, put in your camping bag, and, and you, will, uh, you will have access to this equipment. God forbid you be. So with that, I'm going to let Bill and Ben just kind of help me close the loop on things I might have forgotten. And then we're gonna teach, we're gonna to talk to you specifically about how you can get some hands-on training on the things we just talked about. No, I think Dr. Gestring, you all made very good points that is very important. This community in the Finger Lakes has had accidental death from bleeding. We have a wonderful academic medical center here and, and the trauma system here with the community responders, the professional responders, the, you know, the, the helicopters, the ambulances, the surgeons, the trauma center does a really wonderful job. However, we still have death from bleeding. So I don't want people to think that this is something that is, is by convenience. This should be taken as seriously as knowing how to use those defibrillators and fire extinguishers Dr. Gestring talked about. And people should advocate to have these supplies in their place of business and around their personal uh, communities. And, and I think you'll eventually find that lives are saved because of this training. Yeah, and I think these stop the bleed kits can be, uh, they're, they're certainly compact enough. We've seen a lot of places have good success with storing them co-located with their defibrillators. Um, and there's certainly a place for them in our community. Very good, well, thank you, gentlemen. Bill, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours, is that correct? Yes. So it's all you. What you should see now is the schedule for uh, training. This is uh, being pre recorded in May. And in the near future, you should be able to see uh, the, the, the websites we're going to give you. So now that you've, you've heard and may have watched this video training, 
you understand that there's a component of this that needs to be done in a way that you can have your hands on it, know how much force to press, know what the proper technique for packing is, understand how the hook and loop and latch and strap of the tourniquet works. So what the community has done is really rally together in the spirit of Stop the Bleed Week and EMS Week is to generate a lot of uh, locations that you see here uh, across the region where you can go and in a safe environment where people are trained how to behave and keep equipment clean during this pandemic that we still find ourselves in and, and allow yourself to touch and experience and interact with people who do this for a living, have all done this, and learn how to use the technical skills of the equipment. Now, obviously it's very difficult. You can freeze these things here, or take a screenshot of it, but if you want to go ahead and go to these websites, uh, www.melrems.org or www.stopthebleed.org, you can find links uh, off the front pages of these websites to find a class and get the listing of these locations so you can participate on Stop the Bleed Day, May 20th, 2021, that's Thursday, to get all the information and, and be able to use the hands-on equipment so you can get this experience and be trained and proficient with how to do this when an emergency occurs. So I'll reinforce what Bill just said, the training is free, the training is easy, and, and once you've done this once or twice, it's really, it becomes very apparent, but, but watching it without actually touching it, it's a little bit, a little bit harder to get the message across. The training is free, it's easy, and we, it probably takes you know, no more than 45 minutes, if, if that, to, to actually get your hands on this equipment and get comfortable using it. Ben, did you have anything to add about the planning for Stop the Bleed Day? I just wanted to thank all of our EMS partners for, for opening up their spaces and, and working with us on this important initiative. And we look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. This concludes the video training today. And I hope to see you out there at one of those locations to help stop the bleed.